welcome or welcome back to TSC Talks, the podcast inspired by the condition known as tuberous sclerosis complex. My name is Jill Woodworth and I'm your host. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today on the podcast, I got two cannabinoid medicine, cannabis safety, family guidebook podcasts coming at you. Kevin Green from Cleveland School of Cannabis, he's the VP, he's going to talk to us about what they do there. Uh, his insight on the industry, getting involved, accessibility, the wide reach of the programs, particularly at Cleveland School of Cannabis, and uh, their placement rate for dispensary jobs and other jobs in the industry. Really interesting, interesting guy. Also, I have Dr. Mary Clifton, who is a doctor that got into cannabinoid medicine after a personal experience uh, brought her to uh, a try it and realized its potential and started cranking out these YouTube videos or videos on her website related to all different, uh, using cannabinoid medicine with all kinds of different diagnoses. So she, we had kind of a spur of the moment, um, short episode conversation I think she's great, and I hope that you um, follow her on social media. I'll share all the links for her as well as for Kevin. Um, and she also is a telemedicine doctor and got, uh, is very encouraging about the need for uh, doctors and physicians, you know, to meet their, par- their patients where they're at in their own, you know, living situation. So we didn't talk much about that, but I thought I'd mention it. Anyways, yeah, so I just want to emphasize that we're going to be having more, you know, experts or leaders in the cannabinoid medicine field across the industry. Just had a fascinating discussion with a group um, led by a doctor in Israel. We're really kind of making some interesting connections and have some really great opportunities to help make CBD and, you know, using cannabis less fear-based and give relevance to the vast, the wide range of symptoms and conditions for which one can find relief, and particularly teasing away at the concept of cannabis for TSC and getting a protocol in place so those living with TSC or parents, caregivers can use our guide and get some really solid information about how to go about doing that um, without having to wait till we have perfect pharmaceutical formulations of it. The time is now. So I'm going to be pumping out as many podcasts as I can to give this supporting evidence and um, information and resources for all of you out there. Also doing our regular TSC more special needs autism IDD type podcasts. So we're not dropping the ball there. We're going to attempt a magazine format where we have more than one more shorter episodes in combined into one longer, well not longer, hour or less episode and you can you know, choose to listen to part or all. Of course, I encourage you to listen to all because I think they're all awesome. I love connecting with everyone that's on the podcast. And you know, I'm passionate about this, this actual, this work in the cannabinoid medicine field, because I feel like there's just a hole in TSC care, case management, and one small change could cause ripple effects as far as how we are able to, you know, sit with the the level of suffering that our loved ones affected deal with and are going to deal with in the future, you know, based on this huge load of pharmaceuticals that we are more and more dependent upon and cannabinoid medicine being a untapped source of potential relief for so many people. So I'm going to start talking. Keep tuning in. 
please check out our crowdfunder. Stay tuned for more details on the research and the work that we're doing and the opportunities that we're going to be presenting to get involved and keep on keeping on and send me your love notes, hate notes, give us reviews on Apple or iTunes and take it away, Kevin and Mary. Thank you so much for being willing to do this. I appreciate it. So you're Kevin Green and tell me about your title and your role at Cleveland School of Cannabis. So uh, my name is uh, Kevin Green. I am the vice president and owner of the Cleveland School of Cannabis. In my role, I oversee kind of the what we call the bookend. So all of the PR, marketing, community relations, all of our admissions, and then on the bookend, handling our alumni relations, internship projects, and then also our partner projects and how we partner with licensees, everything from obviously job placement to uh, doing different educational seminars, events, sponsorships, all types of things uh, together as well and how we work together to help grow the industry. Okay, so you part, when you say partner with your licensees, do you mean the students that have gone to Cleveland School of Cannabis? So yeah, licensees will be the people that are actually awarded marijuana licenses to either cultivate, dispense, or manufacture cannabis, uh, okay. the, where they're, they're the actual job holders. Um, uh, yeah. for the actual so they're employees. the ones that offer the employment. That's correct. So, okay. I just want to make sure I understand your role. Um, so you, before we get into that, tell me a little bit of how, how you got into the cannabis industry and Cleveland School of Cannabis in particular. Yeah. So truthfully, um, uh, my first real uh, dive into the cannabis industry is actually all through the school. I met the actual founder, Austin Briggs, um, in 2016. And at that point, uh, he was letting me know about what he was jumping into. And he basically started, he came up with this idea after he was in the cannabis industry. He sought out education and support to be able to, one, recruit better employees, be able to educate himself and understand really what the industry provided and just really wasn't able to find that resource. So that provided him the idea to say, well, if I can't find that in California, you know what I mean, what's going gonna happen in a state of Ohio where the industry has been, you know, obviously in a complete prohibition. There was nothing that was, you know, California it was in prohibition as well, but it was a little bit more accepted in that state than it was obviously than it is in Ohio, right? Right. So he knew there would be a greater need for this. Um, and that's what birthed the school. I started with the school in January 2017. We opened the school at that point, just uh, continued to kind of see the opportunities, build things out. And then we've just seen a lot of great success since January of 2017 to see having over 60% job placement rates and seeing our grads not only working in Ohio, but are, that are now opening businesses for the licensees in other states as those businesses continue to expand. Nice. How did it end up in Ohio? It was looking at what was going on in new markets. So California technically right now is considered a mature market. And we knew there would be more of a job need um, and more people looking to get in the industry in, in initially because of obviously the new program. So uh, everything east of Colorado, in the sense of the start of our business, these states are primed and are a better position for us because there's a great need for a talented workforce. And there's a large workforce that's being developed in Ohio, just the state of Ohio, not thinking about all of the neighboring states that are also transitioning into the cannabis industry as well. Yeah, it's a brilliant idea. And, uh, you know, living in Massachusetts, I haven't really investigated the programs that are available out here, but um, I liked what you told us before about having both the online and the in-person component. Mm -hmm. So tell me just about, so if you wanted to go to your school, it's primarily for people that want to enter the cannabis industry, and it doesn't have to be in Ohio. Correct. And you have the online component. Um, I guess what, what I was thinking was about Ohio. What is it? It's medical only there. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And when did it go legal or, you know, statewide medically? The, the bill was passed in 2016. Okay. Uh, plants went into the ground. Seeds went into the ground at the end of 18. So we're only about truthfully a year old in our industry here okay so how many dispensaries are there in ohio right now um where we just broke 30. 30 okay that's better than a lot of people i've talked to in different states so growing growing rapidly so tell me about the school and give me a few you know positions that you train for i know People that might be listening might not be familiar with the different roles that make up the dispensary employment. 
So we have three programs that are directly aligned with the industry. Okay. It's going to be cultivation. So that's going to be obviously all of the harvesting and the growing side of cannabis. So there's a ton of jobs obviously available then everything from your post-harvest trimmers, your packaging, all the way up to the people that are obviously overseeing and running the, the full grow house um, and kind of all in between. Uh, when you think about a cultivation side as well, they actually have to have a sales team and a marketing team also to be able to sell their product to the dispensaries, which a lot uh-huh. of people think that they need that. But we've had a few people that have already are running the sales departments for cultivators due to the fact that they're in sense of knowledge and cannabis and how that applies. So being able to actually not cultivate, but actually be able to sell the actual end product that's actually cultivated in the site. So there's a, a ton of frontline jobs that you're directing directly with the plant, but also, you know, back office jobs that said like sales, marketing, PR, community engagement, outreach, all those positions are held at those. Actually, you can find those positions at almost every type of business in the cannabis industry. So um, the whole thing. So from this, like the minute that you train people for soup to nut from the minute the plant goes in the ground to the you know actual marketing that we get online or whatnot correct so when you're thinking about our horticulture program is teaching you exactly how to grow cannabis on a commercial level so okay it's all the way from seed to, to curing and then bud being ready but the knowledge that a person that has to sell the cannabis that understands how the product is grown is a great salesperson because the best thing a salesperson needs to know is to know their product so we've seen people that have taken the horticulture program been able to transition to other positions because they know it so well and they have other skill sets. You know, we were looking at an industry, it's not just uh, it's multiple age groups, our student bodies all the way from 19 to 77. Wow. Uh, people that have worked in you know other industries that translate. So they're taking their previous education, their work experience, and then they're coupling that with their cannabis education and they're positioning themselves for all types of positions. Oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. Don't forget what you know, because what you know is important. And this is an industry. It's not just about growing and selling marijuana. We're supporting an entire industry. So just as much as you need cultivators, you need managers, you need HR, you need accounting, you need sales, you need security. All those things are played because it's a full entire industry. It's a full entire day-to-day business. Yeah, seriously. And having people that understand the, the whole process adds a lot of value, I'm sure, to the industry more well-rounded um, graduates. Exactly. And that's the reason why we are seeing so much success with our graduates. And that's why we stay above our 60% graduation rates, because our students come out prepared, ready to work that day for an employer. That's a great, great uh, return for them in the sense of the type of employees that they're getting. Oh, I am sure. And um, how long is the training program? Is it different for, you know, different uh, specializations or yeah, there are some variations within the program, obviously, but the biggest thing that's going to determine your time and length is how many classes you schedule every semester. I see. So, okay. um, you know, if you're taking, you know, one or two classes, obviously it's going to take you some time to finish your program. But if you're taking all condensed classes and, you know, you're able to go to school full time, you're in a different type of situation. So normally what we see for a single major, four to nine months, and then we see up to a year for anyone that will take all three majors because we do call that our executive program. So some students will take that because that is the best choice of employment because you know the entire industry okay absolutely and what about the staff and training for the how do you get your teachers and so we recruit staff members from many different levels so obviously we have everything from people that have been horticulturists in the cannabis industry from other states that have moved back to ohio either looking at the industry being here now or moving back to come back home okay we also have lawyers. So we have a ton of lawyers on our books, right? Because we have to teach law and policy. So obviously we have a curriculum team that develops a curriculum and then hire and recruit uh, uh, faculty members. Uh, we have great partnerships with the industry as well in a sense when you're thinking about the actual job placement. So, you know, we have a lot of partnerships across the board for job placement, but at the same time we'll say, hey, do you have anyone in here that might want to be interested in being a faculty member? So uh-huh. a great connection tool for the students because now they're actually being taught directly by somebody that could be a potential employer for them so they even get a better chance to showcase themselves so a lot of our students start their interview the first day of class because they're getting taught by somebody that's directly in the industry oh that is so cool i love it yeah as far as the any of the the online versus the um in person so what is your online curriculum and and do you have people from other states that are taking advantage of that now or is that still under expansion or what's How's that going? Pulling up, all of our programs are available online. 
there's probably maybe 50 students that enrolled into the online program as of now. So our online program is fully live and all okay. programs have been available since April of this year. Um, so that's, we already have about 50 students enroll into the online program. Awesome. Um, have you thought about, you know, expanding like your school as a prototype to different states or have you thought yep. of that? Those conversations are within our expansion plan. Um, obviously, it's always about the partnerships, the job market, and then obviously the laws within that city and what's going on. Right. We'll Complicated. Be, yeah, there will be some announcements made within 2020 about what CC will be doing and uh, other things and other partnerships. Working closer with the federal government as well within how we're rolling out, how we're doing job training, how we're transitioning farmers, extractors okay. to come into the industry. So there's a lot bigger. How are you doing that? Uh, well, you know, I mean, that's all about partnerships and work. You know, right now okay. I can't really talk about it, okay. um, but it's all about relationships. You know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. workforce development dollars that are uh, that are allocated to every single state every single year to develop a workforce when you're thinking about the economy. And that's already there. So what we need to do is basically be able to position the cannabis industry because it is the fastest growing workforce. It is the fastest growing industry um, in the world right now. So at the end of the day, uh, we need to just start to take a look at this a little bit differently and integrate it into all the other resources that are available for other things that are similar in the sense of when we're talking about workforce without workforce without development, because that's what we're doing. Um, it's workforce mm -hmm. development, it's creating a new workforce, and it's training the workforce so they can actually take advantage of the new workforce opportunities. Interesting. My other job, I work for um, a program providing uh, long-term residents wraparound service options for individuals, adults with IDD and autism. And I'm, one of the biggest problems in that, you know, area is employment, disability employment. And I'm thinking like, what a great way to potentially hit two kind of marginalized, and I'm sure this is just a brainstorm type thing, populations where, you know, cannabis has got, got this underdog, you know, up and coming reputation. And then, you know, these huge sectors of our society that are just, we're not capitalizing on their abilities because we're looking at their disabilities and finding roles for as many people as possible in the cannabis industry. So I know there's some talk, at least in Massachusetts, about racial equity and giving opportunities for marginalized populations to get involved in the mm -hmm. cannabis industry so i don't know I, I see i see your school having just opportunities all over the place right now and that's a big focus on us um that's the reason why we started our grant program so we provide a minority grant a minority and female grant um, we provide oh. a veterans grant and then we also provide a resilience grant for low socioeconomic students that might have financial trouble so there is a definitely obviously a a sense of how do we create this industry to grow in the most equitable way so uh -huh. all communities and all different people are able to take advantage of uh, the industry um, and that, that's a continued focus on us to continue to do everything that we can um, and that's the reason why relationships on every single level are going to be key in this process so relationships with the general public relationships with the actual stakeholders within the industry and the relationships with our politicians, local legislation, all that type of stuff. It's going to be a community and a collective impact model that's going to make this thing work. And mm -hmm. uh, we are 100% focused on facilitating that. Ah, oh, that's awesome. So what's the cost or how is it per course or do you give package deals? And you mentioned a few grants, which is fabulous. Yeah, so our program is a $6,500 program for each single major. If you take our executive program, which is a combination of all three majors, which is the horticulture major, the dispensary major, and a medical application of cannabis major, that will be 12500 If you are awarded a grant, a grant can be up to $2,500 okay. per person to get a grant. Um, within the school. Uh, we also have no interest payment plans as well. And we've made some partnerships with banks and private lenders for school loans. And then we're working on our own student loan program right now that we're hoping to be able to be released, you know, hopefully soon. We've been approved with the company, the finance company. So it's just getting everything uh, together to take the next step on that. Wow, that is great. It sounds like you, you really like thought ahead in a lot of these areas. And that's so important, especially where it's a new industry and there's just so much controversy with the federal and uh, state legislation issues. So in terms of your thoughts on the cannabis industry and like if anybody that might be interested in getting into it but might be hesitant, 
can you offer some like encouragement in terms of jobs and placements? I know you, you covered like the percentage rate was 60% placement. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. I think the main thing for people to understand is that there is a ton of opportunities yep. and to stop looking at the industry as just growing it or working in a dispensary. When you're looking at a new industry, what creates the biggest opportunity is the fact that the innovation in the industry hasn't happened yet, right? Mm -hmm. There is still to today that there are people who are still innovating how we cook an egg. You know I mean, you could watch TV late enough at night and there's going to be something saying, this is the best new tool we use to cook an egg with, right? You yep. can cook an egg for quite some time in, in the sense of our history as human beings on this planet, right? Yeah. So if you think about that industry still being revolutionized, the opportunities that are in an industry that is just coming to light. It's not to say that cannabis hasn't been ingrained into society for some, it has been for hundreds of thousands of years, right? right? We've been in a prohibition for 90 years. Prior to that 90 years, cannabis was in almost every medicine. Hemp was being, was one of the most used fibers out there to create all range of products. And hemp is truthfully the main reason why cannabis became illegal because it was such a great textile, it was eating into the cotton, and they just didn't want that. That industry didn't want that. And then obviously marijuana was being basically created in the sense of that, that, that slang term, marijuana, instead of cannabis. And then that was used to basically continue to disenfranchise specifically uh, the, the African-American community and obviously the Mexican community because of the immigration and what was mm -hmm. going on at that time. So knowing all of that, it's the fact that it's always been here. That's the reason why, even though it's been underground and we're in prohibition, cannabis industry has grown so much. And that's the reason why we're seeing the revolution happen. Because at the end of the day, when we look at the raw numbers, Americans, people across the world vote hand over hand to say that cannabis should be legal and should be integrated into our normal lives. And that's yep. the reason why we're seeing things move so fast now in the last uh, to, uh, 10 years. It's amazing um, um, being on the, not on the older side, but coming around to using cannabis personally kind of later in life for mental health issues and trying to reduce dependence on pharmaceuticals, just being like, wow, I uh, wish I'd known about this a lot earlier in life and understood it. There's just a lot of fear and stigma. And I guess, how do you deal with that type of, you know, do you, have you had issues with, you know, legal aspects and countering people's embedded misunderstandings of cannabis as a education program you know do they take i mean i can see that people might think oh well yeah that's that can't be serious you know we're gonna well, go to hot school or whatnot so yeah we don't ever fight against that because we know that people are going to come in with all different mindsets on where they are with cannabis right uh-huh but that's why education is key Yep. Come to PSC, you're going to learn something. No matter uh -huh. what, if you have a conversation with one of my admissions officers, if you attend an open house, and if you enroll into the school, you're going to leave here with more knowledge about cannabis than your own personal doctor knows about cannabis. And that's just a fact. Yeah. Um, so the situation in education builds nations, and that's one of our, our slogans and campaigns that we're running this year. Education is what's going to turn the corner. At the end of the day, we thought the world was flat at one point. You know what I mean? I think that's right. We thought the, the earth was the center of the universe. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's so many things that we thought. Right. We oh, I know. Medicine, yeah. When we look at the, the development of medicines over the last hundred years, you know, we used to put, you know, if you think about what's going on with economic development and redevelopment at home, we used to put lead in our paint and in everything. And then now we're trying to go back to every old home and every old community and get lead out. And right. Then, so why do we understand this now? Because we've taken the time to educate our population. Mm -hmm. So the more we educate our population, we're able to get people on the right track with the right information. And the more we continue to put the dollars into research, we're going to find out even more things. What we think we know about cannabis is just the cusp of what we're going to find out about cannabis in the decades to come. Oh, yeah. I, I've heard from so many people that were just at the very tip of learning about the, the plant and all the cannabinoids within. Yep, I agree. Just at the very tip. This, this whole thing is just starting. And that's why there's so many opportunities. Yeah. We don't even know what this industry is going to look like in 10 years because it's going to change so much. Right now, we've gone in the last two years when basically no one even knew what CBD was to the fact that you can get CBD at CVS. Yes, thanks for bringing that up. Now, do you, what is your education process on CBD there? Do you um, just kind of include it with the regular curriculum or... We'll be uh, dropping a hemp CBD um, major next year. But when it comes to CBD in itself, you'll learn a little, a lot about really what the endocannabinoid system does. And the endocannabinoid system is a, a system within the human body that interacts with the cannabinoids in itself. So understanding the cannabinoids and the profiles, the, all the, because it's more than just CBD. CBD is just the most popular right. one right now. 
That's all it is. Right, There's because it doesn't have the psychoactive and everybody Correct. seems stuck on that idea. Correct. It's THC and CBD. Those are the two ones in the market, but there's about 30 cannabinoids that we know about currently right now that all are a part of the process of how your body interacts with it um, in a sense of what, and what type of healing properties does it promote or facilitate uh -huh. within the human body. So as I said, we're, we're still in the early start to the CBD. Yeah. The one that's run right now, I'll say in the next couple of years, is going to be another profile of what's the next big, you know, cannabinoid that everyone's going to be right. talking about and dropping into everything. The hit cannabinoid of the year. Correct. That's all it is. It's the cannabinoid of the time. It, it will eventually fit because we're going to find another cannabinoid. That's even better. <laughs> right. You know, you, and I guess that brings me to one question as far as the interactions with the pharmaceutical industry. I think there's there's a lot of fear that these they're going to isolate these as they find them and make them into separate medicines. And maybe that is not a terrible thing. But if we're waiting for the pharmaceutical industry to provide us with medications that they've deemed safe, that they've developed from the cannabis plant, we're going to be waiting for quite a long time. So in the meantime, you know, I mean, we finding like cost effective and like education ways to use that we can individ individualize it at a person by person level, which can't be done in the you know pharmaceutical industry. But any thoughts on integrating with the pharmaceutical industry or anything about that? The thing is, we want the pharmaceutical industry to play their part. Um, right, right. I agree. I agree. It's you know, just, they need I to play their part. They need to do their research, you know, and be a part of this entire thing. So okay. this industry is large enough for everybody to play their part in it. I think the best thing about what's going on in the industry is the fact that it's not federally legal. It's allowing the general person to become a person that's a stakeholder in the industry, which is not like any other industry. Normally, industries are rolled out to us and everybody at the top controls it. At this point, the people huh. that have the knowledge is the general person. You know, it's general, everyday Americans, everyday people that are getting this knowledge and they have actually already taken the chances and the investments on themselves to be, go ahead and become stakeholders and the, and the doorkeepers of the knowledge to cannabis. Uh -huh. So as we start to move into more of the scientific research, which is where Big Pharma is going to come into play, and then we're looking at how do we properly create dosages per your age, your exactly. illness, things of that sort. We want that type of science behind it, but also we want to make sure that the general public is able to go in and play their part as well in the sense that's how we develop and that's that's what i feel is going on right now so um i think what we're going to see is we're just going to see a lot a lot of advancements within the industry from a medical standpoint from a recreational standpoint and also obviously from a uh, from a, a textile standpoint um mm -hmm. medical and recreation will be a part of the market. The largest market in the cannabis industry, the largest shares will be going to the textile because when you can make every single thing that we interact with can be made with cannabis fibers, you're thinking about a whole different type of situation now when it comes to that because not everybody's sick, not everybody wants to right. spend recreational time with cannabis, but everybody <laughs> needs drywall, everybody needs a table, everybody needs clothes, everybody needs carpets, you know what I mean? We need all yeah. We use it every day that we don't really pay attention to. And when you have a, a cost-effective textile, like the fibers from uh, hemp, you're changing the entire game. Absolutely. Do you ever go to conventions and in different states and market your programs there, or is that not that not necessary? How have you developed the outreach? Yeah, we, we have a combination. So, you know, uh -huh. I mean, running a, a full company, you are you have a marketing mix, right? So you're doing traditional media, you're doing online, you're doing a sense of community engagement. Okay. Uh, we attend a lot of conferences across the country. And that's not always truthfully because, you know, for us, it's there's a bigger picture here than just building and recruiting students, right? You know, I mean, partnerships and understanding who you can work with to take the next step in the industry is going to be key. So a lot of our out-of-state travel is built around how do we build a coalition around cannabis initiatives. Gotcha. Things forward in itself. But as I said, we have a marketing mix. So we're doing everything from, you know, the holidays is coming up. So last year we did a Cleveland Feed the City and we partnered with a large radio station and we felt fed a couple thousand people around the holidays uh -huh. to everything to obviously cannabis focused events that we might bend and sponsor as well, all the way up to, you know, we might go ahead and uh, touch base on uh, lawyer events because it's always key to stay in touch base with the lawyers what's going on the legal side what they're doing what they know so it's a real combination of everything that we try to make sure that we touch uh, we want to be good stewards in the community uh, we want to make sure that we do our part and we also want to make sure that we continue to build relationships beautiful i love your philosophy and your work and uh what's going on there 
really, Kevin, thank you so much for coming and talking to me about it. Do you have anything else you want to talk about or share? I think in closing, you know, definitely want to thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak on your podcast. And one thing I'll say is, you know, CSC um, is always open. We want to be a resource to yourself, to other people. Uh, we're very, very open. You know, every con- uh, conversation we think is key uh, because it only helps us push along to the next step. Everybody's ideas um, and things of that sort. So I tell everybody, wow. don't box yourself in when it comes to this industry. Think wide and broad and as and as far as you can, because when you have so many open opportunities, you can be the person that can create the next best thing that can help this cannabis industry take the next step forward. So, you know, innovate, 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 and no idea is a bad idea because it might just be the next idea we need. I love it. I'm sitting here with a big smile on my face. Thank you so much. Take care and have a great day. All right, Jill. I really appreciate you as well. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Kevin. Now we are transitioning to Dr. Mary Clifton. Take it away, Mary. You know, if there was something here, I would know about it. Uh-huh. So I'll, I, you know, I'll just do a little, a little research work, and I'll convince myself there's nothing going on, and then I can get back to my regular <laughs> life. But there's a uh-huh. lot going on in cannabis, so I just started compiling the research and shooting around it, and then you know we started looking at putting the videos into different groups and uh-huh. um, yeah so I, I'm putting together the videos now for uh, depression and manic depression and psychosis what happens you know with people who get acutely psychotic after they smoke and decide they can fly and jump out a window you know, that actually happened to me and also metabolism oh really yeah well yeah I think it was a combo with cannabis and I was on a whole bunch of pharmaceuticals prescribed to me in a alcoholic mm. treatment program and decided I would, you know, they were oh. really helping and I'd try some cannabis, not really knowing much about it. And I went on quite a trip that really, it changed my um, whole concept of spirituality in many ways, but it also kept me away from cannabis for a time period. But then there's something there, like I couldn't turn away. I knew I had learned something and that despite the bad mm-hmm. trip and circled back. So. Yeah, that's really... Um, yeah, that's important to know about. And it could have been, it's hard to say, it, it probably right. was the combination because there's people that break like that with alcohol exposure or with other drug mm-hmm. exposure too. And But you're right, it was probably that combination. Yeah, there were a lot of other stressors going on at the same time, so it was mm-hmm. like a perfect storm type thing. So not that surprising. You know, it was a scary experience, and I'm sure that you encounter people that have had that kind of a experience with cannabis is Mm -hmm. that true well i think it's just important in a a comprehensive i mean in a comprehensive group of videos that we cover that oh you do you know there's a hundred videos on the site and so i'm just trying to find the stuff i haven't covered yet so addiction (sighs) and like how we use it for treating alcohol or heroin addiction and you know metabolism is important too and then psychosis and depression I thought would be important to cover too. But That's if you awesome. see any other holes, let me know and I'll get those covered also. Have you how how has it been for your own shift in terms of being a doctor that's kind of, you know, it seems like a lot of medicine is very I don't want to say fearful, but just doesn't really know a lot about cannabinoid medicine and then has it been oh, a challenge? Yeah. I mean it's uh it's controversial. Yeah. It's definitely a controversial place to be working in. But it's also just really valuable information, and it's not hurting anybody. Yeah, it's I've been had some to... issues around that. Uh-huh, I bet. But at some point, too, you really have to just make sure people know what's going on. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. As mm-hmm. far as um, CBD, what are your thoughts on the CBD craze? People seem to be turning to that because of the non-psychoactive components and our rather Puritan society mm-hmm. thinking, you know, uh, God forbid I'm quote-unquote high. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think CBD is very powerful. A lot of the, in fact, all the work on seizure has been done. All of the major large randomized controlled trials on seizure were done with CBD. And there's great research around CBD and anxiety. And CBD is very powerful all by itself. So it's a very reasonable alternative for people who want to avoid, you know, any of the psychoactive effect of cannabis and still get the benefit. Mm-hmm. 
And would you recommend, and I know you can't make specific recommendations, but how would you recommend that an individual go about choosing a brand? Well, a lot of people start out with CBD and see if it works and then if it doesn't, you know, switch over to cannabis with various levels of THC. I would recommend that you choose a brand that you purchase from somebody that you trust and that you make sure that the company has third-party testing. It's okay. uh, this is definitely a, a situation where there's a lot of low-quality product on the market. Yeah, but if somebody can produce third-party testing of every batch so that you know what your percentages of product are and you make sure that they're testing their product, mm-hmm. then uh, that's a, a big step forward to getting really great products. You know, I, I mean, you can test just for the THC, CBD ratios, but, yeah, you know, other places are testing for the terpenes and the herbicides and pesticides. There's a lot of different things that people should be testing for if it matters to you. Mm-hmm. You know, exposures to herbicides and pesticides matters to me a lot, but other people it might not matter as much, you know? Right. It depends on what war you're coming from and what you are looking for, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that third part, that, that's yeah. a really great, that's helpful. So if you're looking at CBD, you know, making sure mm-hmm. that the third party testing is solid and, and that they have that and, you know, yeah. what you're getting is actually what you're getting. That, um, that does, that, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, in terms of the industry and the, <laughs> the idea of like, I think what I, one of my goals is, you know, having kids with that are on multiple pharmaceuticals long term, no idea how these play out for life, having to take all these meds and thinking, you know, okay, well, oh, yeah. can't wait for every for the drug companies to develop the specific isolates or whatever they're going to do, trying to find kind of a reasonable middle ground that's not too expensive. I guess, what are your thoughts on the industry in terms of, like, pharma getting involved, and do you have any opinions on that related to that? Oh, I mean, I think that CBD will be in everybody's medicine cabinet right in the front because, you know, we have such great data on pain Mm -hmm. without the kidney issues or the stomach issues or things like ibuprofen and uh, and great data on insomnia and anxiety with much fewer side effects than any of the current antidepressants or sleep meds. But the formulations, you know, I think are going to be really valuable or treating, you know, more serious chronic diseases like Alzheimer's or obviously multiple sclerosis, but cancer. There are so many great formulations, you know, coming in line for more serious chronic diseases, um, especially a lot of gut diseases too, like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Really? So I, I think the pharmaceutical formulations are going to be really valuable for pharmacy or, you know, issues. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just, I think that um, waiting for that to happen is frustrating for people, but it's good that there's people like yourself that are willing to put information out there that we can use in the meantime while we're waiting for however long this takes for these to be, you know. There's a lot of people that are getting great relief just with working with a cannabis doctor on the existing medications and choosing a formulation you know, just a strain that's already available and already growing for a medicinal purpose. And those, I mean, those strains of, you know, if you want a really deep body buzz for all over body pain related to cancer, or if you want something to really stimulate your appetite or, you know, there's already strains available that way. But I'd love to see the pharmaceutical companies really take apart all of the different cannabinoids and terpenes and try to design something really specific for people who just don't get complete relief from the available strain. Yeah. I you know, I've heard really neat work. Yeah. And I, I think it represents an interesting combination of like a big industry getting involved with a real grassroots history. And I'd be a little concerned that it's going to be overrun by people trying to make money. And But I know that the pharmaceutical testing is super rigorous for FDA approval. So, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be really hard to get a lot of FDA-approved medications through because the FDA can only approve, you know, things that have one or two components. And ah. you're looking at, you know, cannabis, you've got stuff that has, 80 different terpenes and 25 different cannabinoids. I mean, 
the mm-hmm. FDA is not going to have any idea what to do with a compound like that. You know, and so I, I don't know. I don't know how successful these companies are going to be at anything ever going in front of the FDA, you know, beyond sad effects that we already have. Right. But, um, and maybe some specific CBD products, you know. Yeah. But they can probably create some pretty awesome strains. I know. I, it's exciting. Everything that's going on with cannabis is exciting. So... If someone is looking to find out information, where can we find you? You can find me at CBD and Cannabis Info. And, of course, like me on Instagram. I would love that. Sure. THC under slash MD or something. Let me okay. See if I can connect you there. And then you can just go to CBD and Cannabis And if, there's, if anybody has a question or if they want a particular video that they haven't seen has been created, then they can just, you know, message me those that all the messages from that site come directly to me. That's great. And as far yeah. as the research that you're drawing from, is it from, is, you said mentioned Israel, is that correct? Oh, there's great research, I think, coming out of Israel. They're doing a lot of work creating formulations, but there's good stuff in Italy too. Italy okay. is keeping a really nice data bank from their dispensaries. And of course, good research coming out of Canada. And the research is getting better in the U.S. You know, we're behind a little bit mm-hmm. because of our prohibition, our restrictions. But there's good research all over the world. Okay. That's really helpful. And then, you know, that's your vision for the industry and working as a doctor. Any thoughts that you can share? Kind of oh, broad. Gosh. I'm excited to be in this industry. I Are mean, you? I, no, I love innovation. I love disruption. And I love when patients get empowered to take care of themselves. I love yeah. everything about the cannabis industry. The people are smart and they're thinking and they're working really hard. And in the end, the patients benefit. Yeah. There's really almost no downside, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, really almost no downside. I mean, if you get too high, just take some CBD <laughs> and, and back it off a little. You know? Right, right absolutely. <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that you do um, another part of your uh, work is telemedicine and kind of making things more accessible. So I love that. I yeah. applaud that. It's great for patients to have access, easy access to doctors and get the care they need quickly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that can tie yeah, into cannabis I love that too. in the future when we loosen up, oh, yeah. when it gets federally uh, approved. Oh, that, yeah. That probably would be a really yeah, helpful. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's actually some really great. I mean, I do consultations on my site, but that's a pretty limited part of my work. I do more like consulting with companies, but um, yeah, but the individual patient consultations will be. I, I have a I have a plan to increase those in like mid November. Really, awesome. Yeah, I'm working with a company, Veraheal, down in Washington D.C. We're launching like a consultation line, but. We'll see how it goes because I've been offering consultation. But it really, the goal here is to make it possible for somebody who has questions to go to my site, learn what they need to know with the research, and not have to spend any money or very little money. You know, any consultations that I yep. set up are going to be very economical and, and affordable and reasonable for people. It's not, you know, all the work isn't leading to $300, two-hour long consult. You know, these mm-hmm. are a quick uh, seven or eight minute consult to answer burning questions. And then those will hopefully direct to additional video. You know, I guess I get the same consult with the same question seven or eight times, then probably pretty clear that there's a hole in the work, you know. And you make a video. So that's what you yeah, do. Yeah, make a video. <laughs> Great. I love it. I'm thrilled to find your site and to talk to you. Thank you so much, Mary. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, have a good one. Take care. (laughs) All right. Bye-bye.